Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Hi again, everybody. Thanks for joining us on Celebrating Act 2. As usual, Art and I are with our favorite medical doctor, Dr. Liz Lister. Dr. Liz, good to see you again. Hello. Michael. Great to see you. You know, um, probably uh, once every six or seven months, uh, we talk about disease uh, prevention. And uh, while it doesn't prevent, certainly before you prevent it, sometimes you want to know whether or not you have a disease to take care of. And probably one of the most important things is a, uh, for women is uh, having a mammogram. Uh, is that still, but there was some controversy recently, is that still uh, the gold standard for uh, at least detecting uh, potential for breast cancer? Yes. Yes, at this time, mammography is definitely the gold standard for early detection. I'm glad you said that. You just alluded to that one important point that it's not prevention, it's early detection, which is also good. That's what screening tests are all about. They're trying to catch, it'd be better if they could catch it before it develops into the disease. However, there's a lot of screening tests out there that catch things early on. And mammograms are pretty good as far as a screening test is concerned. Whenever we have a screening test, we're worried about how often is a negative result correct, what we call a true negative, or also how often, if it shows the disease, is that wrong or a false positive. So the statistics on mammography are pretty good. Both of those numbers are in the 90% percent above 90 percent that's not bad for a screening test and there is absolutely controversy why not mm. it's a while now that there's controversy around mammograms what in my view is not controversial is between the ages of 50 and let's say 75 for women between ages 50 and 75 years young that is not in my opinion, that is not controversial. I believe, I do think that the data shows that mammograms do save lives in that age range. Different organizations recommend mammograms. For example, there are organizations that recommend mammograms below age 50. That's definitely controversial. Another question is how often? Does a woman need a mammogram every single year between age 50 and 75? That's the recommendation in the United States. However, in Europe and Canada, it's about every two to three years. A lot of people out there working on this, collecting data to try to get a real answer to this question, but that's what we have at the moment. And yeah, that's for mammogram. I find it kind of interesting that um, uh, uh, when I was uh, young, I had a, a, an aunt uh, who, uh, she was like, uh, she wasn't a, a blood aunt, but she was like family. And uh, 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 I think she had breast cancer. They never called it breast cancer. They called it something uh, like, I don't even think they called it a disease of the chest or anything like that. But they never called it breast cancer. It wasn't until about 20 years ago uh, that we really started talking about this more publicly. Uh, in fact, I, know that, that I happen to know about it because I was super impressed by a young model who appeared on the uh, 1993, the cover of the Sunday New York Times, uh, her name was Matushka, and she had had breast removed and she had uh, appeared on the Sunday Times magazine with yes. her scar showing. Yes. And from mm -hmm. that point on, people were able to talk about it. But the important thing I think is that beyond the early detection is that today when somebody hears breast cancer, it's no longer a death sentence. The first thing you think about, well, so take a biopsy, and maybe they'll just take a lump out and do some localized stuff as opposed to having a, a surgery. So uh, are these hopeful signs in the medical world still uh, abundant? Or uh, where, where does the diagnosis of particularly early detection breast cancer stand today as far as, uh, is it a death sentence or is it uh, hopeful? Absolutely not a death sentence. The, of course, the earlier it's caught, the better and the more effective the treatment can be. 
There's a little bit of controversy about what is the actual success rate. However, because it depends if you count stage zero or what they call ductal carcinoma in situ or DCIS. So it depends a little bit. Like a lot of the famous uh, actresses that have talked about this issue have brought a lot of attention to it, which is kind of interesting. We can talk about that another time because that's not really the biggest killer of women. Heart disease is the biggest killer of women in the United oh, States, yeah. the world. But in any case, we're always concerned and worried about breast cancer. And so the statistics are excellent for treatment and survival, especially when it's caught in the early stages. Mm. There's another technique that I wanted to just mention to our audience, and that is called thermograms or thermography, breast thermography. So I'm sure that some of the people listening have heard of this. However, it's a little bit unclear. So I thought I would mention a little bit about thermography. Okay. Um, now from the name, from the name, it sounds like it's heat. Therm, that's therm. Right. That's so exactly it, right. it, it, explain how it works. All right. So first of all, the, from the first thermometer that was invented around the 1700s or even earlier, it got to be the 1800s when people thought about using detection of differences in temperature to, to detect illness, all right, to measure temperature differences to detect illness, okay? A lot of interest in this, but it didn't really become technically feasible until the development of cameras. So it was about 1929 and then a little bit after that that the first cameras were developed to detect so we could take an image of you and see differences in temperature, not just on the surface, but also in the structures underneath. Right? So it's kind of interesting. And the idea is that cells that are developing a little cancer are going to be more metabolically active. They're going to be dividing more rapidly, so that generates heat. Also, the idea is that cancers, we know that cancers end up with more of a blood supply. One of the things that they do to become a cancer is overproduce their own private little blood supply, which then keeps them able to continue in existing and growing. And more blood flow is also going to raise the temperature and make it show up as a hotter spot. And it's just the way you think of it where cold is blue and then it goes through all the gradations back through green, yellow, orange, red is, is the hottest. That's interesting. Um, and we know that um, the immune response in, in the body, yes. one of the immune responses I've learned over the years is that uh, your body sends white blood cells it creates heat That's to right. try to fight infection. Exactly. So, um, of course, if you have a cut or something like that, it feels a little warmer. That's and right. the thermography makes total sense. You, exactly. You can see That's right. what the signs of infection based on the heat. That's right. That's exactly the idea. And it's been around, as I said, for a really, really long time. However, it's not considered the gold standard at this point in time. There are women who want to avoid getting a mammogram. It's not fun to have a mammogram. A mammogram requires the compression of the breast tissue. Okay, the machine is designed to do that. It's a pretty good squish to then take the image. Okay, and so it's not an easy procedure to have done. However, the thermogram, it's, it's not painful because it's just an image, but it is a little bit interesting. So I researched it and then I actually had one done last year and it was a very interesting experience. So the woman has to, of course, be undressed. That's for either kind of study. But in order to, what about the response just of having the skin open to the cold air? That's going to change the temperature response. So the woman has to sit for about 10, 15 minutes undressed in a private room, of course, and then do a little bit of equilibrating. And then some people do a little bit of a different, there's a, the steps to prepare. 
and then the image is done. And the image was interesting because I had it done uh, close to the time when I had a mammogram done. And so I wanted, I did that on purpose. And so it's difficult, it, it's more difficult right now to establish the baseline. So it's recommended to have the thermogram and then three months later have another one and make sure that things are staying pretty stable in order to see what the imaging baseline should look like. Is the uh, uh, thermo, uh, thermography, is that uh, 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 radioactive in any kind of way or with x-rays no. or, so in other words, because uh, uh, it seems to me that if there are baselines that while it may uh, not be 100% as accurate as a, a mammogram or to whatever extent a mammogram is, uh, it could maybe be the kind of thing that would be routinely in a, off, a doctor's office at some point if they have baselines and it gets a little bit more accurate. Uh, is that possible? It's, it is, however, there is a process to doing it correctly. So there are technicians who are trained in doing the thermograms. Could it be in, in more doctor's offices? Yes, it could. However, again, you have to have trained staff, you have to have the right equipment. So it's possible, but the biggest problem is that we just don't know how it performs compared to mammograms. We have decades of data on mammography that we just don't have right now on thermograms. So when the recommendation of, when the consideration of thermogram is done, it's always in conjunction with mammography. So right now, even if I order a thermogram for a patient, I'm still going to recommend that she get the mammogram done as well. There was some try some attempts to study this in the 1970s. That's a long that's a while ago now. And the thermogram equipment wasn't what it is now and neither was the mammography equipment that we have now. All right, it wasn't none of it was digital. And so it's really, I don't think, very fair to say that thermography is not useful based on data from 40 or 50 years ago. So I would be delighted for there to be a, another large comparative study. And of course, as you were just saying, it needs to be done over time. We have to have the baseline and we have to be able to do the comparison over time in order to see what can we really detect with thermography. Yeah, so, one, one quick question sure. I have, though, is um, uh, because we this is a lot of information to uh, digest. Uh, uh, there's some, something special about thermography that may uh, help detect uh, maybe uh, uh, nearby metastasizing of uh, of a tumor as opposed to what a mammogram. Would. In other words, is there a benefit that it might have over a mammogram other than uh, not being as uh, squishy, if you will. Well, that is a major benefit, is the comfort for the patient. Mm. The other purported benefit, it hasn't been proven, but the idea is that it would be more sensitive and would be more specific to a cancer as compared to a mammogram. I don't think that's been shown yet in the data. That's why even though I support thermography, I still recommend routine screening mammograms for women over 50. Okay, so the takeaway here is that if uh, you're just gonna have uh, uh, for comfort a, a thermo thermogram with thermography, uh, that's probably not the best. You should only do it if you're using a more traditional mammogram and maybe have that as confirmation or uh, further exploration. Well, you know what? I think that this is so important that perhaps uh, uh, leaps and bounds uh, in technology happen all the time. Maybe we can schedule a review of this in about a year from now. Yeah, it does sound like thermography is going to become, uh, as the as you point out, when the studies get done, uh, more and more important over mm -hmm. the years. That's right. It's great information, as always. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.